Hey, this is Steve in Dallas, Texas. It's Saturday morning, my friend, and you are listening to Light Talk. Good morning. This is Zach, and coming to you from Washington, D.C., and today we are discussing lighting different styles of dance, dealing with house programmers, personal relationships, and navigating the new normal, all on Light Talk. And this is David coming to you from the beautiful Belmont Shore neighborhood of Long Beach, California. And if you don't already know, you are listening to Light Talk and we are the Lumen Brothers. Hello. Ooh, Ooh, yeah, yeah. Coming to you from our FM radio station. We're going (laughs) to listen to the entire side of Iron Butterflies in Agata da Vida tonight. Everybody. Now, now, where are we coming from, though? <laughs> I mean, I'm coming to you from my office on the campus of SMU. What about you, David? Where exactly are you? I'm coming to you? you from my kitchen. Actually, my studio. <laughs> my the kitchen cloud. studio. My, 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 my cloud. My cloud in uh, Long Beach, California from my house. And where are you, Zach? I'm in my home office. There you go. Okay. And that makes this a tax write-off, everyone. So just so <laughs> you all know, you can actually take that home office, figure out what percentage of your house it is, and deduct everything from it. Yes. It balances the massive profits that we make from the show. <laughs> yes, the massive profits that we've all realized these past two years. Anyway, welcome everyone to episode 251, and that's nine episodes from our sixth anniversary show. And do we have any plans? Uh, <laughs> do we have plans for that? I don't know if we have any plans. Because is I, there I think a material may... for this anniversary? Yes, it's, it's oranges. So we've got okay. the orange anniversary. No, I don't know. What nice. well, it is. sounds to me like we're going to dovetail into our appearance at the Super Bowl. Oh, so we'll just <laughs> I forgot about we'll that. Season six. Yes, I, I thought I thought uh, that tribe was going to be doing that. But this year it's the Lumen Brothers. That's what I heard. Well, there you go. So let's see. You know, it, it is 260, right? I did the math like 52 times five is 260. Okay. So I guess it's 260. So we have no idea who's going to be on the show. Uh, it'll probably be somebody uh, relatively um, known and, uh, and with hopefully Zach and, and maybe Stan. I guess Stan will be there. He wouldn't miss our fifth anniversary. He's relatively known. Yeah, he's relatively known. <laughs> so and isn't there the guy who won a chance to be brother of the day? That may happen next week. I'm talking to Brackley about it. I'm trying to get them lined up for next week. So it'll very happen nice. very, very soon. Anyway, let's get started with some news. Yes, news of the industry. And the big news this week, at least in our opinion, because <laughs> there may have been something else going on, <laughs> we have no idea, is uh, this article in the New York Times that came out, and it was titled, Now is the Winter of Broadway's Discontent. Okay, what's, what's that quote from? Shakespeare, right? That's right. It's Richard III. And it's all about the shrinking audiences on Broadway. There seems to be uh, a a thing that's happening. And and apparently it normally happens during Christmas and during that time when when the audiences start shrinking. But this year it's even more so. And uh, we're just going to have a quick discussion about that. And since Zach is our man on Broadway, what do you think this is, Zach? What's causing this uh, shrink, these, uh, uh, this epidemic of shrinking audiences. <laughs> By the way, people aren't, we're not talking about people that now aren't, aren't over four foot seven. We're talking about numbers of audiences. So it's not their height, yes. it's the numbers. Not their physical appearance. Exactly. Absolutely. <laughs> uh, it's an interesting article. You know, part of, part of it is it, dis, it really addresses how, uh, as shows kind of had their own bumpy start, that they went through the uh, the learning process, the growing pains of figuring out how to have backups for backups, basically. You know, if we have three people that can't perform because they have COVID, we have to have like a bench of uh, backup people that can support them. And then when, you know, this guy can't perform, that also means... His dresser probably has to quarantine and the wig person has to quarantine. And how do we back all those jobs up? And unfortunately, as we learned how to do all that stuff, it happened around the same time that this slowdown with the audiences happens. And I think that uh, the slowdown, in my opinion, it's a, it's a combination of things, you know. Uh, you know, as you said, there's always the post New Year's slowdown. You know, any show you know that 
does gangbusters from Thanksgiving to New Year's by January 3rd, they usually all peter out. Um, but there's the, the, you know, I think a lot of people are making more cautious uh, decisions to try to stay home and stay safe, which on one level I support. Um, I think on another level, it's become more difficult to actually get to the show. You know, it's there's less buses, less public transportation. There's, um, you know, issues with uh, having a babysitter. You know, you want to go out to, to an evening in Times Square and you want someone to stay and watch your kids. Uh, what's the process for getting a babysitter? Does the babysitter have to take a test? Can you find a test for the babysitter to take? You know, things like that. And I think that it just has become enough of a challenge to go to these shows that I think some people are just taking, you know, taking a time out and saying, I'll go, you know, after this Omicron bubble bursts. Seems to be a lot of that discussion in, in general of the Omicron is a bubble and it's going to burst. And then I'll go back to the, the new COVID normal after that. Well, you have a lot of tourists coming in too. So right. maybe they don't quite have the disposable income that they had, you know, two years ago. Oh, definitely. And again, I think that's and part again of you know, there we go. Uh, let's get on an airplane and fly to New York from Cleveland and see a show and let's find a hotel room. So there's a, a lot of kind of capillaries that are connected here that uh, inhibit an audience from coming to a, a show. Yeah. I mean, it was interesting. The article did point out too, that like shows that pre-pandemic would never have been discounted are all discounted now. I mean, Hamilton aside, you know, they're saying that the average ticket price prior to the pandemic was 800 plus Whoa. for a Hamilton <laughs> ticket. And now it's about 200 plus, but I know someone that just saw a slave play for $7. The there other you day. go. There you go. 1945 prices. Yeah. <laughs> but, but what he also told me was that at the, at the show, ushers were going to people in the cheap seats and inviting them to come and sit in the orchestra. Oh, I thought you were saying the ushers was going to the people in the cheap sheets and invite them to be in the cast. Do you know this role tonight? <laughs> That's the next step. But you know that in the article they were talking about this uh, one actor in a show, he was playing a totally different role. And the two, f the female lead and her understudy were both right. sick. In Lion King. And he, yes, and he played the role and apparently did a great job. So that's really kind of cool. Yeah. And then also for Wicked, they mentioned that uh, one of the performers in the show, they they flew someone out who hadn't performed the role in a couple of years wow. because they just needed someone on the bench at yeah. that point. So people are getting more jobs in, in a way. It's actually helping. Now we're also seeing the article touched upon this, too, that a couple of shows are taking a hiatus of sorts, mm -hmm. like uh, Doubtfire, which is taking nine weeks off. And basically, they're letting everyone go. And then in nine weeks, if you're available, you, you're going you to have your job back. Um, another show, I can't remember what it is off the top of my head, that's moving theaters. They're taking a hiatus in moving theaters. But what's going to happen is all these shows are going to come back all at the same time. And all of the designers and or technicians, crew members, stagehands, like they're either going to have gone elsewhere for work or they're all going to be fighting for work because it's all happening at the same time. <laughs> right, right. So that'll be interesting to see. Yeah, I guess we're going to time will tell, you know, as we move into yeah. the summer too, the spring into summer, see right. what happens with all that. All right, that's the news. And uh, <laughs> Steve has our first question of the day. Yes, it comes from friend of the show, Michael B. He is uh, binging Light Talk right now, and he told me he was up to episode 88. Oh, my God. Uh, and he just felt this question has not been asked, so, so he sends to us. Uh, whenever I work with a new director, I always ask them how, to, uh, how they would like to approach lighting. From a few directors, I'm always told that they want the lighting to be another character in the show. How do you interpret this statement? Didn't we answer this question in episode 89? <laughs> I, I think so. Probably so, Michael, if you just keep more, going there, you're going to get there. Is he binging there. forwards or backwards? <laughs> he is binging forwards. I, th oh I think he's God. done 88 episodes in like two months. He is like just cranking them out. We love you, Michael, up. but, you know, there <laughs> could be some serious brain damage occurring. So just a little heads up. <laughs> you know, that's a tricky question, and it's, it's an odd question to be asked. So I guess if someone looked at me and said, I want the lighting to be another character in the show, 
then I'm, I might look at them and say, so let's talk about masking. Do you, do you want the lights seen by the audience? And a lot of times when someone asks that kind of variation on a question, they're asking for everything to be stripped away and seen, and they want to see the light come on. They want to see the lens glow up. But, um, you know, that's kind of open to interpretation. What, what do you guys think? Do you, do you hear this statement ever? Uh, all, yeah. all the time. <laughs> <laughs> my, my question is, you know, if it's another character in the show, let's talk about billing. I mean, you know, <laughs> do I get top billing? Do I get, like, you know, co-star? Does this character have a name? Yes, exactly. <laughs> Female, non-nary, who is right. it? Well, one of the things that I think is so interesting about lighting that statements like this make such a challenge to address is that lighting... It, it serves so many purposes at one time. And that like, uh, if you wanted to have a set that was a living room and you put a bunch of practical lights in it, you turn them on, that's not going to make it look like a living room. It still needs to be lit to look like a living room. You know, there's, and, and that idea of what goes into lighting to create a space and to create an atmosphere and create a mood, you know, and, and hopefully you know, when you're lighting something, you're you're doing all those things at once anyway. So in a way, it is a character in the show. So it's kind of like that's a given. Um, but thinking about it like that, I feel like uh, that's a, a question I get asked when it's somebody who's like looking for special effects in a way. Mm. David? Well, I don't know. I usually hear this from directors, you know, and it's like, I think it's a way for a director, some directors to grasp a hold of what, you know, the power of what light, you know, can give to a production. Um, but I never considered a character of the show personally. It's always just, it's basically my art form, you know. So there you go, Michael. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. Um, but uh, keep listening, Michael. You know, like I said, I I think we may have covered it, but you know, listen, we've done what two hundred and fifty one shows. I don't remember what we cover. What we don't cover. Yeah. So maybe Michael can give us like a spreadsheet with the, the the different answers we've given to the same question. Michael, while you're at it, you know that's a good good thing. You know, and uh, we'll pay you with a uh, not ready for dishwasher coffee mug if you'd like. If you do that right. spreadsheet. Hey, Thomas from Atlanta asks, I just got out of school and am starting assisting. My friends tell me to find a nice lighting designer to assist. One of my friends is having a personal relationship with his designer. Should I do the same? Is this wise? <laughs> No. no, pick your own designer to have a relationship with. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> don't, <laughs> don't take your don't friends. Don't go after your friend's <laughs> designer. <laughs> no, 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 no. Okay, okay. All I can say, I've been, we've all been doing this for a long time. And uh, it's probably the biggest mistake that I've seen people make on both ends, whether you're the designer having a relationship with your assistant. And I'm talking about a personal relationship. I'm not talking about friends. There's nothing wrong with being friends. I'm talking about when you start crossing the line. And there are a lot of reasons that are actually very much the same as a typical workplace uh, situation where you have a subordinate and someone in a, in a, 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 a position of power, that it's not a good thing. And keep it professional. Because every time I've seen this happen, it always ends horribly. And you don't want to be that person. You do not want to be that person that people are talking about, that you've made it because you've had some personal relationship with someone in, in a position of power. So no, this is not a good idea. Keep your integrity. We talk about integrity a lot in the show, but I think the integrity is really, really important, especially when you're starting out. Get ahead by being great, right? And get ahead by being helpful, being the problems or helping people solve problems. That's how you're going to make it in this business, not by sleeping with somebody. I mean, it's it's interesting because I, I will say I have worked, I have been on creative team with uh, people that are couples. Sure. So I, it, I haven't had any experience actually working with any creatives where the designer and assistant or associate were in a relationship but I have done a show where the director and the set designer were married. And 
that was an interesting challenge. They were very good at balancing their relationship, but there were definitely times where I felt like I had to call the set designer and be like, can you tell Michael to look at this for me? Because he's not responding to my emails or calls. You know, so I used their relationship to my advantage in a way, I guess. <laughs> right. I don't think Thomas is talking about this, though. No, but I think that the reality is, like, a any relationship is going to have ups and downs. It's going to have good days and bad days. And it's really hard to leave that at home when you're both going to the office together. Yeah, right. <laughs> and you don't want that to color your work. You know, exactly. I think you want to be able to have respect there. And the other part of that, too, which I've said on the show before, is that for me as a designer, like I know that part of my duty as a designer is to help raise up these assistants and associates to become designers themselves. And like I want to be able to be proud and clear headed about these people getting work and having their own careers. And, you know, it seems like another thing you don't really want to bring into a relationship is that competitiveness. Steve? Well, I think the first part of the question uh, could be addressed. Uh, find a nice lighting designer to assist. I think that works both ways. I, I think when I'm looking for an assistant, um, you know, when I'm interviewing people, I do want someone that seems like they're someone that uh, I can have a cup of coffee with, a conversation with, a pleasant person, as opposed to just a complete jerk sitting beside me. That doesn't... Uh, work very well. And I think as a young assistant that you also want to kind of get the lowdown on some of the people you're interviewing with. And, you know, if someone says so-and-so is, is very difficult, that might not be your first choice, uh, you know, to uh, go with. So I, I think you do want to find pleasant people to work with because, you know, there, there are plenty of talented, pleasant people. Not, not everyone has to be talented and um, have a a gigantic ego and uh, eat their assistance for lunch. Yeah, it's funny because the idea of finding a nice lighting designer to assist sounds very much like what my grandma Elaine told me when I was talking about. <laughs> find a nice you person find to a work nice for. Jewish girl. <laughs> yeah, but you know, this is also a person that you're going to spend a lot of like intense time in the dark with. Uh, so you want to get along with them, and also a person that you want to have enough respect for, so that if you're not there. You can feel comfortable right. and safe that they're representing you in the you best way. You certainly don't want to be the assistant who is the victim. Right. You know, yeah. they're going, you know the, the designer is just picking on you all the time. Well, I've been blessed with, with a lot of great assistants in my career. You know, and one of them is one of Steve's uh, <laughs> students, former students. Uh, so uh, it's, it's just great. It's just a wonderful, wonderful thing. Well, Joe in Ronkonkoma asks, I'm doing my first show at a bigger theater that has their own house programmer. Previously, all my shows were at smaller local theaters, and I have programmed for myself. Any advice or tips on how to work with a programmer? I have a question. Hey, Where is Ron sure. Konkuma? Ron Konkuma? Ron Konkuma. I think it's. I think it's in Long Island. On Long Island. Long Island. Long Island. Well, that's where I'm <laughs> from. I'm from Elmont, Long Island. Uh, I don't I think know it's in Ronkonkoma. Suffolk County. Oh, okay. That's why I don't know. You don't know. know Lake Ronkonkoma that it was supposedly bottomless? Bottomless? It goes all the way to the other side of the earth? There was a legend that <laughs> somebody drowned in Lake Ronkonkoma and were found later floating in the Atlantic Ocean. Wow. <laughs> was the mafia yeah, it's involved? Where the, <laughs> Sounds like a uh, mafioso thing. I mean, I'm sure there's probably some mobsters out there. Okay, there you go. Okay. Um, yeah, Ron Konkuma. All right, thank you. I just um, needed to know that. <laughs> no problem. So this is an interesting question because, uh, you know, I've definitely advocated for programming for yourself and using a separate programmer depending on the job, your skill level, your comfort level, uh, the equipment that you have access to, etc. But there is definitely always a potential scenario where you'll have to work with someone else. And it can be challenging to go from just sort of thinking and doing to have to do thinking to explaining for someone else to do. Um, and I know that uh, in lighting world, uh, you know, there's a specific dialogue, a shorthand that has been developed over many years as to how to speak to the programmer in order to achieve what you want. 
which is trickier in the projections world because all these different systems have different interfaces that some of them vary wildly from system to system. Uh, but I think the, the biggest tip, you know, in any situation like this is, you know, prep work, knowing what you want in advance so that you can explain it as clearly and directly and concisely and quickly as possible. Uh, and especially if this is your first time with a new programmer or a programmer in general, going into it, knowing that it's going to be a learning curve and give yourself a little extra time to adapt. You know, don't be super hard on yourself. You know, know that you need to accomplish what you need to accomplish in the time you have. But I think, you know, to take lots of deep breaths and just forge ahead. That's my thought. What about you guys? Well, also, uh, you know, again, have a cup of coffee with your programmer and ask, uh, ask he or she how they like to work, how they like the information given to them. Uh, understand that it takes a few seconds for those fingers to punch those keys. Um, don't try to rush the programmer. Don't all of a sudden start explaining to them faster ways to program or the way you know to program. Uh, let them do their job and uh, give them a little breathing room while they're doing it. David? Well, okay. Um, I've had a lot of experience with this, you know, going into a situation where you have a house programmer. First of all, as everyone knows, I am not a programmer, and I uh, always use a programmer. Uh, so it could be a good thing and it could be a bad thing. And I guess the most important thing is exactly what my colleagues have said, is to sit down with the person, get to know them, find out how they like the work and try to develop a language long before you actually start, you know, creating in golden time. <laughs> and uh, what I usually do, the way I start is I give the programmer a whole list of uh, focus palettes and, um, and, and discuss the way I like things focused and how I like the edges and I will talk and also color palettes and what colors I like and things like that. So it's already in the board. So that before you start in golden time, which is when you're actually lighting the show, um, that it's all there in the board. You don't have to like wait for the programmer to like pan and tilt the light into area 15. All that stuff has been done already. Uh, and also, if there's any special effects, that's there in the in the paperwork. I will give them, okay, we need a water effect. I'm going to need a full stage water effect using the front of house fixtures. Uh, I need a, you know, a shin kicker effect from my down left and down right pitch shins, uh, you know, things like that. So that that program starts, that programmer starts understanding or getting a, an idea of what angles of light and what type of colors and effects I'll use. And then usually by that time, it's then it's just a lot less to learn, you know, for that programmer. So uh, that's how I, how I would do it. Uh, because that's, this does happen, especially in Europe. You, you go into a theater and they will have their own programmer and understand that these, these uh, technicians are amazing. They know the boards. They know the fixtures. If they don't and it's slowing you down, then you really need to talk to the production manager and make sure that things, you know, are either the programmer is replaced, which is the worst thing, <laughs> or basically is spoken to that they need to get up to speed, that sort of thing. I think something that you just mentioned that's really important to look at, uh, when you go to a theater that has its own programmer, um, they may be new to you, but you're the new guy, right. not them. Mm -hmm. You know, they're probably tight with their crew and all the stagehands and they're all friends and work together for years. And you're the person that they've never worked with before. So it's also good once you establish that level of trust to really rely on this programmer to help you because they can do a lot more than just program the console uh, because of their connection to the rest of the crew that that you don't yet have. Exactly. That's pro that's golden advice what Zach just gave. And you can also expand that to everyone, to all the technicians yeah. that are working in that theater. You know, one of the things that I did when I started working in Europe, my first show was at La Scala. 
And I went and I met the entire electrics crew on the very first day. And I told them, uh, you know, how much of an honor it was for me to be there and that I was going to have to rely on them because they are the experts in the theater. And let me tell you, they loved that. And it's true. I, I was sincere, absolutely sincere. And they helped me. They didn't look at me as some, you know, crazy American lighting designer. Uh, they actually, you know, respected me because I opened up to them and said, I respect you and I need your help. So please, you know, if you see something, tell me. Um, and they, and they, it was great. So I think that type of attitude with the programmer is also a very good thing. Well, you are listening to Light Talk. And today, Light Talk is sponsored by... Whammit Corporation's NeuroDraft. Are you bedridden from the latest variant of COVID, major spinal surgery, or a severe case of dysentery from eating that two-year-old backstage Frank? Well, just because you are unable to design a draft in your present situation, your plot deadlines have not changed. And all your former assistants have taken other jobs. What are you going to do? Well, the good people at Whammit Corporation, in conjunction with the Fatherland Institute of Wacky Neurological Experimentation, have come up with an answer for all your drafting and design needs. NeuroDraft. And how does NeuroDraft work? Just import the 3D files of the set and theater plans, along with an inventory list of available lighting fixtures, apply our patented electrically charged sensors to various places on your body, put on your tropical scented VR helmet, and plug everything into the NeuroState USB port, and voila! Lighting atmospheres appear through your visual cortex like the last five minutes of 2001, A Space Odyssey. Just choose which atmospheres you want, and a light plot with all applicable paperwork is automatically created. Our optional large-scale plotter will even create hard copies of the plot, sections, and production paperwork. And NeuroDraft will pay for itself before you know it by putting all those backstabbing little EV assistants out of work. Hit the bricks, losers! So don't let your infirmary and ever-changing COVID deadlines put a damper on your creative process. Allow NeuroDraft to create your next Tony Award-nominated show. And remember, your secret is safe with us. And now, back to Light Talk. Well, the sound of those rabid ducks means that once again it's time for Let's Talk About. And today's Let's Talk About subject is Keeping Your Sanity When Your Shows Are Being Postponed and Cancelled. A lot of designers are struggling with this new normal. How can we navigate living on the financial and artistic edge during the pandemic? Now that things are happening, like, again, you know, where people are canceling shows and postponing shows, are there any strategies that we can use to actually survive throughout this time? That is a great question. I think we've actually talked a little bit about what we've done for self-care during the pandemic when there were no shows. And I think a lot of what we can do now to keep ourselves sane is continue that self-care and to continue with having a schedule. You know, I find that uh, if I start my day as if I have work to do uh, every day, then the days when I don't have work to do, I'll just find other things to do. Um, but keeping a schedule and, and keeping yourself active and engaging your mind and your brain in different ways uh, to find some kind of consistency when our work has no consistency, I think, is a really helpful tool. Well, I think also um, trying to stay informed. I mean, there's nothing worse than kind of listening to rumors and guessing and creating all these kind of nightmare scenarios. I think if you, if you can stay informed, about what's happening with the theater you normally work with or the designers you work with, that uh, helps a great deal. And um, remain a bit flexible uh, in your schedule. I do agree with Zach. I think having a daily routine is a, is a great idea. You know, you get up at the same time, you do a little exercise, you have a healthy breakfast. Uh, you, you still have to function. You can't just you know, sit in your lazy boy watching uh, Bonanza episodes all day and all night <laughs> long and, 
you know, not shaving for 32 days and putting right. on 50 Right, don't go pounds. all Howard Hughes here. <laughs> well, I, I mean, unless you have some type of schedule, um, I do think it, it leads to a little bit of anxiety and depression because you can't imagine what's going to happen. Yeah, it's it's crazy because, you know, you talk about staying informed. A lot of times the producers don't know that, you know, I, I mean, like this Helsinki show <laughs> that's supposedly still happening, uh, that could change tomorrow, you know. It, it's uh, There are a lot of moving parts that could fall apart, you know, with students, you know, traveling internationally, uh, designers traveling internationally, uh, you know, what's happening in Finland at the time. Uh, you know, it, it's just, we don't know. We're not going to know what's going to happen in February and March right now. So there's a lot of unknowns there. And I'll be honest with you, if I was strictly a freelancer, I don't know what I'd be doing. I, I, it'd, be, it'd be freaking me out right now. Uh, at least I know that I have a steady income. But not everybody is has that uh, ability, you know. They don't. They're not in that place. And a lot of people have left this business because uncertainty. But you know, when is it going to be certain again? We don't know. Right. We don't know, and that's the crazy yeah. thing. Well, I think the other part of that is that knowing that you're not alone, yeah, and that you can, you know, find virtual happy hours or. Just talk to your friends and collaborators who are going through the same thing and just ha fe getting to feel like you're not the only one that this is happening to can go a long way to helping you uh, feel better. Asking other people, how do you deal with this? What did you deal with? How did you deal with the fact that your show got postponed or, you know, we weren't able to go to do the show in Japan, so they had to bring in someone else to do it, something like that, you know, whatever the circumstance might be. Uh, you know. I think some, you know, it's that's free therapy right there in a lot of ways. Mm -hmm. Well, I think you're right. It, it's a great time to reconnect with your friends because we've all been so busy in the past, and now's an opportunity to uh, to reach out and, and say, you know, how's it going? Right, right. Yeah, I've I've uh, reconnected with a lot of my friends during this time. And, uh, and a lot of my former students as well, who are now, you know, some of them are already established, but some are just starting, you know, they're doing small shows and those shows are being canceled or postponed. And, uh, you know, it's, it's hard, especially if you have a family, I, I think that's, you know, a huge, um, consideration, uh, when you're doing this, uh, you know, both Steve and, and Zach have families. Uh, I don't, but I, I know that a dog. I, I do have a dog, <laughs> and actually now with Lori, I have two dogs and a girlfriend. So, <laughs> but that's all. Getting there. I'm getting there. I'm, I'm I'm moving my way there. But it's it's very very, um, you know, you, you got to be flexible. Like I think uh, Steve said, and you and you just need to uh, be able to keep on trucking and keep pushing your way through. I think that's really the way to do it because if you love it. If you love being a designer, you love the collaboration, you love creating theater, you love telling stories, you know, there's no better way of doing it. And maybe, you know, it's going into video. Who knows? I'm kind of surprised that a lot of these shows now on Broadway aren't just saying, screw it, let's just do a video of this damn thing, get, make sure everybody gets paid, and, uh, and, we'll, and, and, you know, we'll broadcast it, we'll, we'll stream it somewhere, you know, until things get normal yeah. again. I think some of them are going that route. And I think that, you know, I've actually seen a lot of that happening regionally, which is really cool because I think like, for instance, down here in the DC area, Signature Theater, which is a Tony Award winning regional theater in Northern Virginia, has been streaming a lot of their shows lately. And I think the good news there is that they are attracting a lot of attention regarding the quality of their productions Excellent. and when it's safe to go back. I think people are going to say, I saw that thing that was streaming yep. and it was great. And I yep. want to see what they're doing. I want to see it live. Exactly. Yeah. I, it's a win-win yeah. situation. Live is never going to go away. No, no, that, that it'll, experience. It'll come back away. eventually. Yeah. Yep. Cool. Well, Steve has our last question of the day. And it comes from the heartland of America and a friend of the show, Candace W. And she writes, are there different approaches to lighting dance, given the different forms and styles of dance? Uh, okay, 
Uh, yes, yes. I mean, just think about the think about you know off the top of my head, uh, ballet, modern, postmodern, tap, hip hop, ballroom, jazz, tango, waltz, flamenco, aerobic uh, dance, uh, acrobatic dance, uh, belly dance. All of these tell stories in in very different ways. So yes, I think um, uh, is there a commonality? Yes, probably to sculpt them in some way. But uh, ballet has a tendency to look very different from postmodern. Postmodern looks very different from uh, ballroom dancing. So I think you're telling a story and you're having to decide what is important as you tell that story. So if I'm doing ballet, you know, the face becomes a lot more important in ballet than it does, say, in uh, postmodern, which is the most abstract of the, of the modern forms. Uh, so yes... Yes, there, there are all kinds of ways to light dance. And just to put some booms up and some backlight up and call it a day does a disservice to uh, your art and to the choreography happening on stage. I saw Lar Lubavitch a few years ago went on a jihad against booms. He did not, I mean, he not, not only did he not want a boom, you could not put a boom in one of his shows. He wanted high pipe insides, nothing on the floor, no low light, no kickers, nothing. And really what he was on a jihad against was uh, all that light that is hitting legs that he found terribly distracting. So, you know, you could approach Lars' work a couple different ways. You could either say, oh, well, this is going to be terrible because I can't have any booms in it. Or you can embrace what he's trying to do, which is create that world up there uh, with a, a different type of lighting rig in the air. What do you guys think? Well, I think that that's really a good answer, Steve. And that applies to not only to dance, but to anything you're designing in sure. any genre. There is no sort of, you know, system of lighting. There is like, okay, I'm going to have booms, I'm going to have this and that and box booms and blah, blah, blah. You know, that sponsor that we just did was sort of a joke on that. Well, they're all jokes, but, <laughs> but it was sort of a joke on, on an actual piece of software that, and I'm not going to mention it, that where you actually put in the, the, the plan of your theater and you put in your inventory and then you press a button and magically it would create a light plot for any show that you were doing. Now, I guess that may be okay for like a high school that doesn't teach design or whatever. And, and maybe the teacher has, doesn't know how to do the light plot. But it's so generic. It's a generic thing. And that's not where we work. We work in a, 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 an art form that is... Tell, about telling stories and being creative with light and scenery and uh, costumes and whatever other visual and oral art forms we're doing. So a style is so important. And whether you're doing ballet or you're doing uh, postmodern or if you're doing a musical or you're doing a realistic play or whatever, that doesn't say, okay, I'm doing a realistic play, therefore I can't use booms. That's crazy. You've got to be free and you've got to follow the style and design intention of that play or dance. No, I absolutely agree. When I, when I was a young designer once, I was working with Jules Fisher and he told me that the secret to being a good designer is not to have a style. I mean, we all kind of have a style, but the idea there is to adapt to what are the needs of the story. And I think especially in dance where you have so many wonderful opportunities to illuminate things in a different way than you might in a traditional theatrical scenario, that it's really about, you know, what, what emotions do I want to, to highlight for people? You know, what is the, is this something where it's really about the feet? Is this something where it's really about faces? You know, what's the story that I'm trying to tell here? And I think that uh, between you as the designer and whomever is the director or the person who is making those kind of decisions, you know, you, you create whatever the style is for that particular production. That's right. And, you know, sometimes you want to just hang shin kickers for the sake of hanging shin kickers, just to make sure that if the director says, you know, what we really need here is a low light here. That's fine. Just because you hang something doesn't mean you have to use it. Okay. Right. Don't get into that trap ever. 
Yeah, the the light won't take it personally <laughs> if you didn't if you didn't turn it on. Well, I tell that I've told the story before, but the, in the beginning of my career, uh, I had an electrician come up to me and say, "Do you realize that you're not using 17 channels in your plot?" And I said, "Probably." <laughs> you know, I mean, I thought I was going to need them, but I didn't, so I'm not going to use them. You know, I'm not going to just bring them up to 10% just so I use them. That's ridiculous. No, yeah. th don't be afraid. Make your decisions, be bold, and be prepared. And it's okay to, to evolve that style and your decisions throughout a production. You know, we all have tech through a show where we find the visual language right around the end of <laughs> Act 1, and then we go back and tech everything else to get it back to that language that we've discovered in tech. Exactly. Right. Boy, does that happen a lot. And I don't think we've ever mentioned that on the show, but that's a really good thing, Zach, that you discover really what the show's about and how to create this visual language or what it is. And then you say, well, but I have 47 cues and we're doing something else. So what? Change them. Who cares? Right. You know? Change it. It's like halftime at a football game and you're losing. <laughs> there you and go. You come back out and all <laughs> yeah. of a sudden you're doing great. I can't tell you how many times I've gone back and relit Act 1. You know, I, I get into what Act 2 is working great because the director and I have five going. We know what we're doing now and now we got to go back and address Act 1 again. And it doesn't yeah. take a long time to do it. Once you know what the answer is, it's just a matter of just getting it done. So Exactly. Well, the rocking sounds of the Luminoids tells us that once again, you've spent another morning listening to Light Talk. You can hear our show on Spotify, iTunes, Google, YouTube, LiveDesignOnline.com, Amazon Prime Music, and just about every podcast site out there. Check out our website on LightTalk.org for future guests, and be sure to follow us on Facebook and subscribe to the podcast. That way you will not miss a second of Light Talk Insanity. No guarantee is offered regarding the accuracy of any statements or opinions made on this podcast. However, if you do decide to litigate the law firm of Flecked, Flocked, Flair, and Glare, and their paralegal Snoot, will defend us until our retirement funds are depleted. Light Talk is written and produced by the Lumen Brothers, coming to you from Washington, D.C., Long Beach, and the Republic of Texas. And be sure to join us next week where we chat about more useless things and explore the crazy shenanigans in our industry. Light Talk, broadcasting questionable Lumen knowledge and humor around the world. So we'll see you all next Saturday morning. Bye-bye from Light Talk. Bye-bye.